the most wonderful thing about triggers is I am the only one. Well, sadly, that's not the case. There isn't only one trigger. Um, there's lots of them and there are different kinds. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, this is in the context of recovery from certain conditions which involve addiction or compulsion. Okay, so uh, if you're dealing with recovery from sex addiction, uh, porn addiction, alcohol addiction, or a form of OCD where there is uh, a compulsive behavior which you are uh, working on remaining abstinent from, okay, um, then this will apply equally. Okay, so there are lots of different kinds of triggers. It's always a really good uh, exercise to write down triggers, probably more so for um, addiction than it is probably for uh, for something like retroactive jealousy. If you suffer from retroactive jealousy, it's ego dystonic. So this often is the difference between, I'm going to explain that big word in a minute, um, this is probably the difference between, the main difference between uh, most compulsions in terms of obsessive compulsive disorder and that kind of thing and addictions. So addictions are usually what we call ego syntonic. Okay, so let's look at Homer Simpson. Okay, Homer Simpson um, addicted to donuts, but he likes donuts. Okay, so uh, he doesn't mind thinking about donuts. Um, he doesn't mind eating donuts. He wouldn't mind going to a donut factory. Um, not a problem for him. Uh, whether he should uh, continue to consume the level of donuts that he does is another matter, and whether he might consider going into recovery for donuts is another thing. But uh, with retroactive je with retroactive jealousy, for example, and other forms of OCD, lots of forms of OCD, it's usually ego dystonic, which means you don't like it. Okay, so retroactive jealousy, we don't like thinking about retroactive jealousy thoughts. We don't like thinking about the triggers and things like that. So, um, so with a, an addiction, to write down all the possible things that, that trigger you, and when I say trigger you, this is this is assuming that you've achieved some kind of abstinence, and this is these are the things that uh, you find tempt you or make you more uh, more inclined, more likely to lapse or relapse. That's what we mean by a, by a trigger. It doesn't mean that you do lapse or relapse, um, because just because you're triggered doesn't mean you have to at all. There's lots of things you can do. There's Black Swan coming along there. I'll try and get you a shot of him in a minute if I can. Um, but um, that's throwing me off my train of thought now. Say EHD for you. Black Swan, completely lose the plot. So <clears throat> that's what a trigger is. and. Uh, generally speaking, the difference between a compulsion with something like OCD is that you don't like it very much, and an addiction generally something that you do uh, like too much. Um, so I'll give you another example. OCD uh, often it often is focused around contamination. So some people feel like they've uh, contaminated their hands and need to wash their hands. It's not that they love washing their hands. It's not that they think that's a fantastic, enjoyable thing to do. Um, they don't, you know. And, and often the you know the classic thing with that is people making their hands really sore. So they don't enjoy washing their hands, but they they are compelled to do it because it takes away the obsessive thought, the obsessive thought about the contamination. So ego dystonic, so think of the word dis as in dissing something. Dis is a negative, uh, syntonic as in uh, synthesis or, sim or um, uh, yeah, synthesis. Is a, there's a better example, but I can't think of it, uh, being something that you like. Okay, there, is, there are exceptions, so uh, what tends to happen with addiction, um, a bit further down the line, somebody that's been an alcoholic for, you know, sometimes 40 years, uh, doesn't really actually like drinking that much. They just drink to take away the unpleasant um, symptoms. And often smokers, um, people that are trying to give up smoking, say so they don't actually enjoy smoking anymore. They just smoke because they feel they have to. So, so it's not completely black and white, but it's, it's pretty much you know um, obsessive compulsive disorder, ego dystonic, um, addiction, ego syntonic. So there you go. That's a diversion already. We've gone off track already, but that's that's the way I like to do things. I like I like tangents and diversions. So I've defined what a trigger is and there are different kinds of triggers. You can break them down into different categories. So uh, so if you're suffering from addiction you might want to write a list of your triggers. If you are suffering from OCD you, you probably won't want to do that but it's a good exercise with addiction. 
And it's good to have some awareness of the kinds of things that might trigger you so that you can be prepared, because being prepared is everything in this game. And planning is everything in this game. Recovery is all about planning, really. Recovery from anything is about planning. So, triggers can be anything. Um, I mentioned a black swan just then. That could be a trigger for somebody because um, you, I don't know, um, you, and I'm thinking more of like a, a, an alcohol addiction thing here is that, you know, you used to, you used to drink in a beer garden that was uh, on the banks of a river and uh, you used to feed black, black swans with your beloved on beautiful sunny days that never seem to end and that makes you think of you know what a nice cold lager sorry I shouldn't say that because it'll be triggering people um but you get the drift so anything at all so triggers can be uh events uh people um individual people um uh not just people um although just people can be a, you know crowds can be a trigger um, but certain people are very, you know, can be can be very tricky because of the meaning that they have to us, those people, and the associations and the memories attached to them. Um, songs, movies, the weather, um, all kinds. Now there are um, external triggers. There are things that you know we have no. We have some control of because we can choose to an extent where we go, not completely because there's certain places that we have to go from time to time. Um, it'd be very impossible for us to just avoid everything forever. But um, so there's certainly, you know, say like for a, somebody with an alcohol addiction, pubs, um, generally speaking, pubs can be avoided. Um, and sometimes people, when they're in really strong recovery, um, they might go in a pub for a particular reason, but they wouldn't hang out in a pub because of the old adage, if you stick around in a hairdresser's long enough, it's only a matter of time before you, somebody cuts your hair. <clears throat> so, triggers can be absolutely anything. So there's different ways to categorize them. Um, the categorize them, one I like to use is direct and indirect. So, um, a direct trigger would be, um, the example of the black swan that I gave earlier on because that had a mental link back to uh, the the problematic behaviour the behaviour that you, you attempted to stay abstinent from uh, so I gave the example of the, the, the beer garden now black swan could by the same token be an indirect trigger because uh, and I'm going to go completely silly here and say so maybe all your family were pecked to death by black swans and the, the the very thought of a black swan reminds you of the trauma and takes you into you know brings up all kinds of really painful emotions and those really painful emotions make you want to uh, act out your addiction whether that's gambling addiction or sex addiction or uh, any kind of substance okay so by definition, a direct trigger is something that, that reminds you or has a direct mental link for you, it's very personal, to the uh, behavior or substance uh, that you are seeking abstinence from. And an indirect trigger is something that uh, generates a mood state. And the mood state, you then uh, feel the need to fix yourself using your behavior or drug of choice. So in a way, it doesn't that distinction kind of doesn't matter, really. You don't have to go around kind of working out which one's which. It's just important to know that there are both. Because people sometimes think of the obvious. If you ask, you know, um, it's always easy to use al alcoholics as, um, for examples. But um, it's easy, you know, most people would understand that an alcoholic probably doesn't, you know, in recovery doesn't, doesn't want to go down the pub. And it's, and it's not a good idea. Not everybody does understand that. Unfortunately, people say, oh, you can just have an orange juice. That's not the point. Um, but um, not everybody understands that, uh, you know, one of the main reasons people uh, use addictive behaviours is to fix a mood state. Okay. So again, compulsions are different. You know, people don't, um, people might be more compulsive when they're upset about something, potentially. Sometimes if they're upset about something, it actually just distracts them and they're, they're, they're not as compulsive as, as they normally are. Okay. So that first one applies more to addictions. The second one applies equally to both, and this is that there are conscious and unconscious triggers. Okay, so 
And this is useful for people with something like retroactive jealousy that, that relapse after um, a long period and don't know why, you know. Uh, they're doing fine, their recovery is really good, and then they go back into the obsessive thinking and all those thought patterns. Um, and they're, they're not aware, and they think, well, you know, did you say something, did anything trigger it? And they say, no, you know, I'm not aware that it did at all. So, biggest part of our perception is unconscious okay because if we consciously attended to everything that our senses told us everything that we heard through our ears or saw through our eyes um, we would be insane probably we would probably be exhausted um, and we would probably be so unfocused that we wouldn't be able to kind of do anything useful so for example the all the um, all the things that we uh, all the sounds, all the conversations that uh, go on around us that we're not actually taking part in or even particularly interested in, that we generally we kind of screen out. But, you know, we they're going in unconsciously. It's not that we don't hear them. We still hear them. You know, it's that kind of classic thing of uh, in a cafe you're having a conversation with somebody and there's a million and one... Um, that's a little bit hyperb hyperbolous. Um, there's, a, there's, you know, 20 other conversations going on in the background where you screen those out. But, you know, some of that goes in. Um, and, you know, we catch things in our peripheral vision. So we, we might just scan a page of a newspaper. We might read one article on that page of a newspaper. But there'll be other articles in the newspaper. And we'll kind of have some awareness of them, but not necessarily a conscious awareness of them. Uh, and things like background music. Um, you know, you're in a restaurant and they're playing, playing background music or somebody's got the radio on in the background. Um, or even a passing car with the stereo turned up, turned up loud. Uh, oh, there's a whole bunch of black swans now. I'm going to have to interrupt myself and just show you the black swans, especially having uh, used them for examples. A really nice sound actually black swans as well they kind of um i had one kind of talking to me the other day so i so the thing about triggers as well that's particularly interesting is they can be fast or slow somebody can be triggered and it might not have any effect for they can happen instantly they, they can take effect instantly uh or they can be slow burning they can sit in the unconscious mind for um months um all right we'll sort our little screen out see there's no slick on this channel it's raw just like addiction and retroactive jealousy and ocd are raw so these things can sit around in your unconscious for ages and, they, and then they kind of they can it's like they suddenly they get detonated and they can start to to take effect now the, the example i, I like to to give on this is um, a lot of my background is working in uh, residential drug and alcohol treatment centres or rehabs as we used to call them and I still like to call them and uh, the rule there was if anybody uh, is an abstinence based program if anybody um, used or had a drink while they were there they were discharged but they could apply to come back um, they just had to regain sobriety and, and demonstrate that they meant business and they could come back so there was somebody that um, Actually, I, I noticed the smell of alcohol on them and it was me that kind of um, uh, ended up discharging them and asking them to leave. But they, and it's somebody I'd worked with on, on quite a close one-to-one -one level. Um, and uh, they came back, which was great. And I picked up with them again, worked with them again. And, you know, first thing, first thing we did, we got a chance to talk was, well, what happened? What led up to it? Uh, I don't know, I've got no idea. All I can remember is holding a bottle of drink in my hand and um, shaking and then I, I took the bottle of drink out of the supermarket and started drinking. Um, no memory of anything odd that had gone on before, nobody had upset them, um, they were feeling well, you know, they had a reasonably good day, um, very, you know, very ordinary day in rehabs if there is such a thing. Could not identify a trigger for, for to save their life. So we did a bit of hoobly doobly because um, I'm a hypnotherapist. I don't, um, 
I don't use this kind of aggressive hypnotherapy very often, but I thought let's let's use a bit of hypnotherapy here and see if we can identify, you know, and obviously I was that person, you know, how do you feel about using some hypnotherapy? And they were very up for that. Um, and they identified what it was in, in hypnosis. It came very quickly, very clearly. Uh, nothing else came into mind as soon as, as, soon as they uh, remembered it, the emotions, you know, they connected the emotions to it. So I was, you know, I was satisfied that, that we'd, we'd hit the nail on the head. So we just did a, um, a, a regressive technique that um, just asks, uh, just really just asking the unconscious mind to spill the beans really, um, for want of a, a more um, complex explanation. And the trigger actually occurred at least a month before the relapse and had percolated away in the back of that person's mind. And, and the trigger was walking past the church where a wedding was taking place. And they kind of clocked it, you know, probably looked, but were thinking about other things, um, didn't really consciously um, ruminate on whatever that meant to them. But it meant something, you know, there was a, you know, and obviously you can imagine how a, a, a wedding could mean all kinds of things to people. Um, you know, could, could uh, bring up regrets, could bring up um, regrets of not getting married, regrets of getting married, um, and regrets that you weren't able to uh, give your children a kind of wedding that you wanted to, you could go on forever, couldn't you? And obviously it's personal meaning to that, that individual. Um, so that was an unconscious trigger. It kind of, it came in through the back door um, and lurked around in the shadows before eventually kind of manifesting as a trigger. And again, I say trigger doesn't mean you have to do it, just means that you have a temptation to, you have an urge to, you have a desire to. So that's two ways of looking at triggers. Okay, so uh, conscious, unconscious, direct, indirect. Okay, so direct is something that relates to the uh, behavioural drug of choice. Indirect is something that induces an emotional state, which could be a positive emotional state or a negative emotional state. Because, you know, um, like just going back to alcoholics, it's always easy to talk about. Uh, alcoholics, you know, like to drink because it's a sunny day. They like to drink because it's a rainy day. <laughs> they like to drink whatever day it is. So, um, so that's triggers. So just uh, depending on you know what condition you're in recovery from um, they will have a slightly different take so if you're um, if you're in recovery from any form of addiction um, you know kind of unwanted sexual behaviors that kind of thing then making a list of all the possible triggers is a fantastic idea uh, if you're suffering from some kind of compulsion then um, actually thinking about your triggers and identifying your triggers is probably going to be quite distressing and, and, and triggering. So probably not the best thing to do, but just recognize that um, triggers will come along. You can, the other thing with triggers, just, just to touch on briefly, I mean, this is probably something for another video, is some triggers can be avoided and it's a good idea to avoid them. Some triggers can't be avoided or some triggers can be avoided but it's not a good idea to avoid them. And some triggers can be avoided for the short term but not the long term. Uh, nearly all triggers can be managed. Okay, so for an alcoholic in the early days of recovery, you know, they, generally speaking, it's good to restrict your, your uh, where you go. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I'm getting a bit dry. And what you do quite a bit. That's a good idea, um, but you can't necessarily live your life like that. So you have to start introducing some of these trigger situations, or trigger people, or trigger places, or trigger activities into your life. Uh, and the way to get around that is you manage them. You have a plan for them. Okay. Um, so if you have retroactive jealousy, then yes, you can uh, you can avoid trigger places and trigger things. Uh, sometimes that's a good idea, sometimes that's not a good idea. It certainly can be a good idea in the early stages while you're just trying to um, do what I call get the inflammation down. So when somebody's in the early stages of retroactive jealousy, um, you know, they just feel awful and their, uh, their anxiety levels are through the roof. Um, the level of distress is really high. So you need to kind of get that right down so that you can kind of start doing some work because you can't really... Um, do healing work when somebody's at a high level of distress because there's, there's you know they're in fight or flight you know they're, they're not in the place to sit down and, and use techniques 
so um, so certainly in the early stages of retroactive jealousy it's good to um, or the early stages of retroactive jealousy recovery I should say is good to um, avoid some of those triggers but as time goes on it's better to kind of bring them in but do strategies to, to take away the power from them um, so that's something we can talk about some more if, if you've got any questions on any of this stuff let me know because um, the trouble is one one issue one you know one um, topic you know like triggers um, just overlaps and dovetails with other topics related to things like relapse prevention recovery and that kind of thing uh, and other really useful and interesting things um, and it can kind of go on forever so <clears throat> if you know if anything in particular has caught your interest or you want me to say more about other aspects of this then, then let me know but different kinds of triggers um, triggers can uh, affect kind of OCD uh, compulsions and um, addictions um, they have a slightly different character depending on whether it's a compulsion or an addiction uh, there are different categories of triggers and there are different ways of managing them and those ways of managing them will naturally change over time but you need to do that very carefully and very thoughtfully hope that's helpful uh, if nothing else i hope you've enjoyed the view of the lake island and the black swans and we'll be back with you soon with more stuff Rangi Marie, thank you for watching.